Hello, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Antonio. I'm a software engineer at Yelp. I work on the metrics team. Uh, so what I currently do is uh, working on observability and real-time metrics and real-time processing. Yelp mission, I hope, oh, okay. Yelp mission is to connect people with great local businesses. We have more than 127 million reviews on our website. And uh, on average, every month, we do 26 million unique mobile devices accesses uh, via the Yelp web app, and 84 million unique visitors uh, via the desktop uh, via the desktop website. We have offices all over the world, and we are more than 400 engineers working both on the product and the infrastructure. So, a due introduction before to start. This talk has been inspired by the talk Stop Writing Classes by Jack Diederich. I highly recommend you to watch the talk, it's great. And uh, by the blog post, The Controller Pattern is Awful and Other Objective Oriented Heresy by EV. Again, great blog post, highly recommended. All the code that you're going to see in this presentation, and trust me, it's going to be quite a lot. Uh, is available on GitHub at that URL. So all the code runs and does tests. Feel free to clone it and play with it. It's for you. Now, uh, I'd like to start from the very end of the talk with the main two takeaways. Uh, so they might make little sense to you at the moment, but keep them in mind that maybe at the end they will be like, you know, cool ideas that you can use at your daily day job. So the first one is let users utilize all Python features instead of just inheritance. And the second one is go for decorators when your classes have only one method and are instantiated only once. All right? So what's this all about? Why we're here? Well, this is the reason. How many of you have ever used Celery? Quite a few. Oh, nice, nice. Well. Celery is an asynchronous um, job queue based on distributed message passing. It is focused on real-time operation, but also scheduling and this kind of stuff. So the way you define a task in Celery is uh, defining an app using the Celery API, and then calling the decorator task on the app object that you just created in order to decorate your task function. So this is the first example on their website. And this is the pattern that I'm going to show you today. This pattern is very, very common, actually, and is used by a lot of cool frameworks. Uh, for example, you know Flask, right? And uh, Flask is a micro framework for web development. And uh, the way you define logic for your root in Flask is exactly the same as you define task in Celery. You define a Flask app, and then uh, you call the root decorator over the app object you just created with some parameters, in this case, um, the URL you want that function to be executed for. And then you just give it the function that is going to encapsulate the logic you want to execute. This is a very common pattern for uh, web frameworks. In fact, also the Pyramid frameworks use it in order to define views, which are basically the same concept of roots in Flask. As you can see, you just call the at view config decorator. You pass you pass in some arguments, and then the function you decorated is going to be the logic that is going to be executed. Uh, this is, again, the first example on their website. Now, what about classes? As you notice, the name of the talk is Write More Decorators and Fewer Classes. So if you ever try to write a test in Python, it's highly likely that you have read about unit test. Unit test is now in the standard lib in Python 3, so I guess it's the recommended way of writing tests in Python. And the way you do it is you define a class uh, inheriting from uh, unit test or test case, and you define some uh, test methods that are going to have your assertions in order to understand if your code is doing the right thing, or at least what you expect. And in case you want to execute some setup or teardown methods, what you do is that you override a method with a specific signature, in this case, setup. And here, you may do all your setup logic. In this case, for example, what the example in the Python documentation does is um, instantiated a widget object and attaching it on the fly to the test class. Now, PyTest, which is an alternative framework to write tests, avoid the usage of classes 
uh, substituting them with the decorator. So if you use the pytest.fixture decorator in order to decorate your setup logic, then you don't need a class anymore, and in order to access the object that is returned by your, uh, setup, your setup function, what you do is that you pass the name of the function to your uh, test functions, and it works magically. So as you can see, the interface is much more linear. You can use all the, all the concepts from functional programming and everything, and well, at the end of the day, it's just shorter. So that's cool, at least. That's what I think. So I wanted to understand how you implement this stuff. It's like, how do you write these decorators in order to avoid using classes or to build clean interfaces? Well, what do you do when you want to understand how some code works? You go on GitHub and read the source, right? So I went to the PyTest project, and uh, this was the result, which is eh, kind of complicated. So I say to myself, well, PyTest does a lot of magic. Maybe Pyramid is going to be easier. Uh, nope. It was even a little bit worse, maybe. But yeah, again, Pyramid is a mature framework, and it has a lot of business logic, and handles a lot of you know, corner cases. So Celery. Celery was simple, right? Nope. Celery was the worst of all. Like, as you can see, it's a wall of code. I have no idea why they put all this code, probably because they wanted to handle a lot of corner cases. And so my reaction after seeing the Celery implementation was this one. Um, and I say to myself, decorators are hard. I'm not going to use them. So who believes this sentence is true? No one. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Or maybe someone there. Well, it's actually not entirely correct. Uh, a few months later, I looked more into how decorators work in Python. And basically, the way they work is that you define a function which receives as an argument the function you want to decorate, and the result of the decorator function is assigned to the function name. That's pretty easy, right? And in case you want to pass arguments to your decorator, the way it works is that the decorator function is going to be called with the arguments before, and then the result is going, to use, is going to be used as a decorator, as we have just seen. And in case you have more than one decorator, the way they get executed is that the closest one to the function that you want to decorate gets executed first, and the result gets passed to the decorator that is upper level. So actually, I changed my stance after that, and so I decided decorators are um, pretty easy to use, but maybe I just are too bright. Well, this is not entirely true as well. So this is the simplest decorator ever made, I guess. Um, as you can see, what it does is just, when decorating the function, it prints decorating function. Pretty useless, but it's a decorator, and it works. In fact, if we execute it in the Python interpreter, that's what we get. The first time we import the function, the decorator function is going to be executed, and decorating function is going, to be, uh, is going to be on the output. And then every time we execute the function, nothing happens. So just execute the regular function. So after this, maybe you can think that decorators are easy to write. Again, that is not entirely true. So in case you want to implement a decorator with arguments, as we saw before, the way you do it is um, defining an inner function in your uh, decorator function. And that inner function is going to be the real decorator, the one that we saw before, so the one receiving the function as first argument. While instead, you can use the arguments that you pass to your ideal decorator in any other part of the function itself. So the way it works uh, for this decorator I implemented over here is that when the function gets imported, it prints decorating function with bar and buzz, which are the two arguments that we pass to the decorator. And then when the function runs, the function runs without any modification at all. Now, if we want to do something more useful with our decorators, like for example, changing the way the function is called or saving the result into a cache and that kind of stuff, we need a wrapper function as well that is going to be in defined inside your decorator function 
and these wrapper functions receive at argu for arguments the arguments of the function you want to decorate. So a piece of advice, if you want to write code that is reusable, just use args and vargs, so you need to care about what the function you're going to decorate is taking as parameter. And the way uh, this decorator function works is that, again, when executed in the interpreter, it decorates the function, and at import time, it prints decorating function. But now, every time we call the function, the code that we've written in the wrapper function inside the decorator function is going to be executed before the function gets executed for real. Now, with that in mind, my stance on decorator is that they're neither easy or hard. They're just a bit tedious to write, you see? Quite a few corner cases to remember. But once you know how to write them, once you have this free example in front of you, that it's kind of OK. I mean, it doesn't take much time. And in fact, if we look at the Flask framework, which is a great piece of software in my opinion, this is the way they implement their decorator, which is not much different from what we saw before, and it's much, much simpler than all the other decorators we've seen so far. So basically, in the Flask class, which is the one we use to instantiate the app object, we define a root method, which takes some parameters, and since it's a decorator that takes some parameters, we need an inner function, and this inner function is the actual decorator. And in the actual decorator, what Flask does is defining an endpoint using the options parameter that we provided, and then adding a rule for the endpoint to the app. Then it returns the function, and it returns the inner function. So my talk was supposed to stop here, to finish here. But then I noticed I booked a 45-minute slot instead of a 15-minute slot. So I decided to go for a real-life example. Um, so basically, we're not going to see decorators for a while. What we're going to do is looking at the class-based interface that this example implements. And uh, then we're going to look at how we can rewrite it with decorators. So the example I want to take is StatMonster. StatMonster is a real internal framework that we use at Yelp to extract real-time metrics out of logs, where logs are just stream of events. And uh, this is not really important for the presentation, but just to give you much more context. So uh, the way StatMonster works is that it consumes log from Apache Kafka, which is a distributed streaming platform usually used to you know, um, put log, like carry log around uh, your infrastructure. And then it does some custom logic, which is implemented by the users via an API, and emits some metrics to signal effects which is uh, a third party services that we use in order to visualize and analyze our metrics, and to Kairos DB, which is a fast distributed scalable time series database uh, on top of Cassandra that we maintain internally. So to reiterate, the input for StatMoster are logs, and the output are actually metrics. This is an example of what StatMoster does. So in this example, we see that the input is a log line, which is JSON formatted with some information. Then some user code gets executed inside StatMoster. A StatMoster, StatMoster emits a timing matrix, so basically just you know, timing the result of a function or something similar, which has a name, a timestamp, a value, and a dictionary of uh, attributes that we call dimensions in the matrix world. Now, let's look at the metrics interface. The metrics interface, it's uh, composed by three little pieces. The first one is an enum defining the two kind of metrics that you can um, emit, which are basically just counters in order to count events, and timers in order to time them. Then we have the metric definition. We use the name tuple here. And a metric, as we say, has always a name, a timestamp, a value a dictionary of tags, which we call dimensions, and the type. And at the very end, we define two commodity functions in order to uh, give the user the possibility to instantiate a counter and a timer without providing the type using partial. OK. So let's look at the input interface instead, so the logs. So this is where, this is where the class is already come in play. Basically, the way a log class is defined is um, defining a decoder function, which is going to be used in order to decode your log line. In this case, we provide the JSON decoding 
as default, but you can just override this default just setting your um, custom decoding function as a class attribute. And then the base class, which you are seeing at the moment, just define a decode class method which is gonna be used to decode the log line. And the second thing is the name of the log you want to tail. So StatMonster is a dynamic system, so the way it works is just inspect at runtime all the classes defined in the framework, and it checks for this name field, and it just tails from Kafka all the logs named this way. So if we want to implement a log, to say to StatMonster, tail this log for me, that's the way we do it. It's pretty easy, it's reasonable. Uh, so we just subclass the log base class and we just provide the name, in this case, events. Now, in case you want to provide your uh, custom decoding function, the way you do it is just that you define your uh, function at the very beginning and then you set up the decoding function as a class attribute of the log. Now, let's look at the StatMonster interface, so uh, the real code is. The StatMonster interface is based on the concept of trigger. A trigger is a class which encapsulates the logic to extract metrics from logs. And this is the base trigger class. It does very few things. So the first one is defining owners for every trigger, so we always know which team is responsible for which logic. And uh, what it does is asserting the owner. Um, then this field is gonna be a list of strings. There is no way for us to encode this information in Python, and so we decided to start writing a little bit of a tutorial so people could read it and uh, you know, understand what they needed to pass to the function, to the, to the class. And then every trigger needs to implement a digest method. The digest method is what is used uh, to transform the decoded log line into metrics. Actually, in the, it's supposed to be a generator, and it's written in the tutorial as well. So this is the core of StatMonster. This is all the logic that really matters, and that's the process function that receives the log we are consuming from, the line we just consumed, and then it iterates over all the triggers, and it tries to yield from the digest method called on the entry, so the decoded log line, and in case of any exception, it sends an email to the owners. Now, this is the way a user basically uh, instruments that monster to consume a log, and then to emit some metrics out of it. So as you can see, you first define the log as we saw before, then you define the owners for your trigger, in this case, just me, and um, then you define your digest function. Your digest method what it does, at least for this trigger, is just yielding a counter, saying we saw an event with this timestamp, and we just count one. Here it is another example. You define the resource usage log, you define your trigger with your list of owners, and then in the digest method here, we loop over um, just a custom tuple of S time and U time, and we emit two timing metrics based on the content of the, of the log line. So this all worked fine. Uh, we published a tutorial and we started to have some users, but then we realized that our users are not just regular users, they are engineers. And uh, you know what the problem with engineers is, right? You give them a Lego set and then they build a flying Death Star out of it. So the first question we got as soon as we released the tutorial and StatMoster was, how do I narrate from a base log class? Well, uh, I didn't think about it, so uh, I answered, well, let's, let's do so. So you define a module starting with underscore, and here you define your base log class. In this case, what the base log class is doing is basically providing a decoder for Apache log lines. And now, uh, with a bit of magic, we tell StatMonster not to look for these underscore prefixed modules so we don't start consuming logs that don't exist. Okay, that's cool. So that's the way you use this kind of base classes in your regular module. You just import them and you set the name of the log you want to consume. Pretty easy, we updated the tutorial and we thought we were okay. Well, that was wrong because as soon as we updated the tutorial, 
we got this other question. How do I inherit from a base trigger class? Because now I saw you, I can inherit log class, so I want to inherit trigger classes as well. All right, didn't find, they didn't think about it either. Um, so what we decided to do was basically reusing the same pattern. So in this um, same underscore module, you define your base trigger with some logic. In uh, this case, for example, you ask the user to set the metric name and the endpoints that are written in the log line as class attributes. And then uh, you also ask him to implement your uh, get additional dimensions metric, uh, method, for example, where you can actually customize the metrics we are going to emit. And then you provide a digest function who does some logic and calls the get additional dimension method and uses uh, the endpoint and the metric name that you define as class attributes. And at the end, he yields a counter. So with a bit of magic, we say to StatMonster again, just don't look for these underscore modules for triggers as well. And uh, that's the way you use them. So you just import them, and then you just set those owners, endpoints, and metric name attributes for the subclass, and then you implement the get additional uh, dimensions in order to customize your metrics. And that's it, it works. So again, we updated the tutorial. It started to be a bit long, but users were happy for like 24 hours. Um, because then I got this question, how do I generate from two trigger classes at the same time? Well, <laughs> I didn't think about it either, but you know, Python supports multiple inheritance, so we started to work around, around it, and um, our answer was, you just don't. So let's keep things simple. You implement your base class with some logic, and then you inherit from it in your other base class, and you define some other logic. And then um, what you do is that define another base class while well, you still inherit from it, and you define some other logic. And then in your real uh, module, you just uh, subclass from both of them and provide to them the same parameters as class attributes. So I get it, this is not ideal, but as long as it's documented, it's gonna be okay, right? Uh, then after more or less one week, we got the first code review in for adding a new trigger. And uh, this is the first question we got. But how do I test my trigger class? Uh, because you want to write tests, right? Well, guess what? This time I was prepared. Uh, you remember PyTest, right? So the way you can test your trigger is just defining a fixture in PyTest when you return the instantiation of the trigger you want to test. And then what you do, uh, you call the digest method on the trigger, and you test a certain matrix. Is in, it's in the result of the digest method. Easy. One minute after, he asked me, but how do I test my base trigger class? Right? What's the difference? I don't understand. Well, if you look at this class, it inherits from service based trigger. And service based trigger in its init asserts that the derived class define a metric name. At the same time, it inherits from trigger, which in this init asserts that it defines owners as well. So you cannot really instantiate it because the assertion is gonna fail. I was very puzzled by this. Like I stayed one day thinking about this even under the shower. I didn't find any good solution. But then a colleague of mine uh, came up with a very good idea. Let's use in the Python's picture the type function that Python's provide. So with the type function, you can instantiate a subclass of a certain class at runtime, and also you can provide class attribute as a dictionary. That worked. Um, we updated the tutorial. It started to be long enough that people didn't want to read it, and yes, I guess it's okay. But uh, let's try to make things better, right? So I'm gonna demonstrate to you that my face, before using the creator, was this one. 
and after switching to a decorator based interface, he changed it to this one. So looking back at the SatMoster module, we got logs as input and metrics as output. So what's missing here? What is missing is the trigger. What is a trigger? So we say the trigger is a class that encapsulates the logic to transform logs to metrics. Well, just get rid of it. It doesn't have any actual reference to the real model. It's just an abstraction that we constructed ourselves. Why did we do it in the first place? No idea. So let's remove it. And uh, let's not force people to utilize just inheritance for the interface. Let's give them the power to use all the features that Python provides. So in the new interface, the metrics interface stays exactly the same, no modifications. The logs interface started already to change a bit. So instead of using classes only via subclassings, we decided to give the user the ability to just use classes either were, as they were meant to be used by Python. So you can instantiate your class this time, and you pass the name of the log and the decoder function as parameters of the init method. And no more session over here, and the decode class method now became uh, a simple method. The only real difference from before is that now every log class defines an empty set of functions. Those functions are what are, going, are basically the equivalents of triggers in the new interface. Now, this is the way you define a log in the new StatMoster. You just use the class. That's it. You don't even need the file for each log. You just you instantiate it with the name, and it works. And in case you want to pass in your own decode function, you just call the class, and you pass the parameter. That's it. It's already much cleaner. But now let's look at the StatMoster interface. So first of all, the process function stayed exactly the same, but became a method of the log class. And again, we, the only thing we did was substituting the trigger with the functions set that is attached to the log class. Now, this is the way we wanted the user to utilize the new interface. The way you define some logic in order to transform your logs to metrics is now importing your log uh, object that you created somewhere else, and then uh, calling a decorator method on top of the object, also using another decorator to pass in the owner's metadata to the function, and just thus define the function. The function is exactly the digest method of the first trigger we saw, without any modification. You just remove all the class thingy. And um, basically, the way the decorator is implemented, it's the simplest decorator ever. What it does, it just receives the function as an argument and it just adds it to the set that is already attached to the log class. That's it. Now, this is even simpler than Flask. And in case we want to provide some more helpful um, decorators, like for example this one, which makes you able to register the same function for multiple logs at the same time, what we can do is implementing a decorator with arguments, and the arguments is the, basically the list of logs. And uh, in this case, what we need is just an inner function where we iterate over the log, and we call the register method once again, because remember, it's a decorator, but at the same time, it's a method. And in case we want to implement this owner's decorator that gives some metadata to the function, what we do is exactly the same as before. We pass it to the handlers as uh, parameters of the function, and we just attach on the fly the handlers to the function, because every function in Python is also an object. So I know that some people are religiously opposed to these, so in case you don't want to monkey patch your function, you can always define a dictionary as a global and then use it uh, in the closure of the upper function. It works exactly the same. Now, this is the way this um, register decorator is used. As you can see, we import two logs and we pass two logs to the decorator. 
And actually, I also want to point out that the owner's decorator removes this ambiguity about, oh, is the owner just a string, or is the owner a list of strings? Like, if you want to pass in more owners, you just pass in more arguments. And the Python interpreter is going to check that for us as we don't need more assertion because the Python interpreter at import time is going to check that we created the two logs we want to register the function for. The code of the function, once again, is just a digest method of one decorator we saw before. Now, let's go back to the questions we got. So how do I inherit from a base log class? Smiley face. If you want to subclass your uh, log class, you can, but if your idea is just passing at the coding functions and then avoiding to pass it over and over and over, what you do is just to use partial, and then you instantiate the new logs using the result of partial. Next question, how do I inherit from a base trigger class? Well, no more base classes, no more assertions. What we do is just defining a simple function. We define a function, yielding some metrics, and having some attributes, as uh, the attributes of the class before as parameters, in this case the endpoints, and even the additional dimensions method is now just a parameter for the function, and then we call it. That's it. So we just yield from the function within our, you know, logic. And that's what we do. We don't even need methods, we don't need subclasses, we don't need to remember to assert for class attributes, it's all done by the interpreter for us, for free. But how do we inherit from true trigger classes? Double happy about this one. What you do is just you define two functions. This is uh, the digest method of the first trigger that we saw uh, when we saw the example of the multiple inheritance. This is the, exactly the same code of the second trigger that we saw before. You just call them both. You don't even need to ask me. Just call functions. Now, let's go back to tests. How do I test my trigger class now? Easy as before, even easier. You don't even need the PyTest fixtures anymore. It's just a function. You call it. That's it. And um, how do I test my base trigger class? That's the thing I'm the most happy about. Uh, it's basically another function. You just call it again. And the way you mock your stuff is just passing some random strings, like, for example, test as parameters. You don't need to use the type uh, function that Python provides. You don't need to remember about inheritance and everything. You just pass in a string. So, but now that we removed all the assertions, how do I make sure that all functions have owners? Well, we write a test. What the test does is calling the collect function, which is the one used by StatMaster to collect runtime all the logs. We iterate over the logs, and we just check that they have the owner's attribute set. So, well, that's even better than before, because we transformed a runtime error to a test that could fail before we even push some function without owners in production. So it's everything we did, so implementing these decorators and changing a bit interface only for user's sake. No, actually, for um, the most part, it was a selfish interest, because you remember that I talked a lot about the import system of StatMoster, the thing that makes StatMoster understand which logs it needs to consume, which classes it needs to execute, and that kind of stuff. Well, you don't need to understand the code, but this is the import system in the new StatMoster. Just look at it and compare it with the old one. It doesn't even fit in the slides. And actually, this is uh, a version that I wrote in Python 3.6, so it's much more compact than the Python 2.7 version that we used. And that makes me very, very happy. <laughs> now, closing up, the main takeaways of the talk were let user utilize all Python feature instead of just inheritance, as we saw, and go for decorators when your classes have only one method, for example, the trigger class has only the digest method, and 
they are instantiated only once. Actually, we never have an even uh, uh, instantiate the trigger class ourselves. The framework was doing that for us. And now, instead, what you do is you instantiate your load class whenever you want. You even want to subclass it, you are free to do it. You don't want to, don't do it. And all the triggers disappeared. They're just functions. So just to clarify, I'm not saying that we should move entirely out of classes from, it's just use classes when they're useful. In this case, the log class is still a class because it has some states and it has some behavior. And it's used as class are supposed to be used in Python, not only for inheritance. So when it makes sense, go for the creator. When it makes sense, go for classes. And that's the end of the talk. Uh, remember that we are hiring, uh, especially for our offices in London and Hamburg. So if you want to work with Python and on big uh, real-time uh, processing streams and kind of stuff, just uh, come to talk with, uh, to us at our booth, just in the big hall. And don't forget to follow us on every social network possible, Facebook, Twitter, and GitHub. Yes, nowadays GitHub is a social network. And um, please read our engineering blog, where a lot of smart engineers, why better than me, um, speak about all the cool stuff that we build every day. Questions? Thanks, Antonio, for your presentation. We have time for a few questions. No questions? Please. Hi. <coughs> Hi. Did you run into any uh, specific situations where uh, switching to using decorators made it hard in practice uh, to debug certain problems? So where the decorator obscured the actual problem that you were trying to get to? That, that's a very good question, actually. So uh, you may have used decorator. Uh, so they are very complicated, like to do a lot of stuff. And uh, they are then very difficult to debug because they change the way the function is executed. And then you got these weird stack traces, and you don't really understand what's going on. Well, my true sense of this is that as in any, uh, while always writing code, you want to keep it simple. So my two cents is decorators should always return the function untouched. It's like the function should be able to be called without using the decorator, and the decorator should stay really small. So the frameworks that I showed you before have very complex decorators, but they are very much a framework uh, with a you know, good open source community, and a lot of features just came into it. So my two cents, especially for uh, your own uh, production code, is keep your decorators simple and avoid to do a lot of stuff into them. I hope it answers the question. More questions to Antonio? No? We well, thank you, Antonio, for your presentation. Thank you for coming. <laughs>